<laughs> uh, the shir that we're going to be learning about tonight is called When to Do Hoshanas. And some of you may feel, well, what are we doing this? Sukkis is over. Over uh, mano bottle carbono. You know, it's it's already it's already for following. You know, so um, I, the truth is, I was planning to give this year the Monday night before circus, and then I got sick, and um, and I think that there's a value to uh, to learning about it now because we have a whole year to think about it <laughs> for next year. But it's also a fascinating study. Um, because it turns out that the different minhagim as to when to do hoshanas in the davening is really rooted in some very, very um, uh, interesting halachic discussions when the appropriate place to do it is. Um, and as we'll see, the minhag to do hoshanas uh, right after Hallel is not as well rooted in the poskim as the minhag to do hoshanas after Musaf. However, there seem to be some very strong and compelling arguments, nonetheless, to do Hoshanas after Hallel. And that's something that we're going to try and look at tonight. <clears throat> so, um, this is a purely academic discussion. I want to give that disclosure and disclaimer at the outset. This is an academic discussion. And we're not here to change anything at this point. Um, so, but let's first take a look at the sources tonight. Um, the Mishnah tells us what the practice was in the Beis HaMikdash over Sukkot. We know that there was a, a necessary practice of davening to Hashem uh, on Sukkot for Mayim, because this is when, according to Chazal, Hashem judges the world for Mayim, for water. And therefore, there were a number of practices that were done in the Beis HaMikdash, such as the Nisu HaMayim, such as the water libation that was done over Sukkot, and the Hakafa and the walking around the Mizbeach uh, on Sukkot uh, with plants that grow by water in order to appeal to HaKadosh Baruch Hu to provide us with water for the season. The Mishnah therefore says, Mitzvah Arava Ketza, what was the mitzvah of the willow branch that was done in the Beis HaMikdash? We're not, not going to read the entire Mishnah. It's a Mishnah in the fourth parak of Maseches Sukkah. But if you skip down to the second line, after it says taku ve'iriu v'taku, that uh, after it says they blew the shofar, the chol yom, every day, makifen is hamizbech pamechas. They would, the word makifen seems to mean that they would encircle the mizbeach one time. Va'omrim ana Hashem hoshiyana, ana Hashem hatzlichana. They would say the words that are written in Hallel. Please Hashem save, please Hashem give us success. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Ani Vaho Hoshiana. That's what they would say. This is a certain special way of configuring the names of HaKadosh Baruch Hu into a certain way. Ani Vaho, which is a certain way of appealing to Hashem. And Vaoso Hayom Makifen Azamizbeach Shiva Pa'amin. And Vaoso Hayom on Hoshana Rabba, which is the last day of Sukkot, they would encircle the Mizbeach seven times. And, uh, and that seems to be what they would do. Now, it seems from the context, when the Mishnah asks the question of mitzvahs arava keitzad, what was the mitzvah of arava, it means that they would encircle the Mizbeach with the, with the willow branch. This willow branch was quite tall, according to the Gemara. It was over ten amos tall, such that you could lean it up against the Mizbeach, and the tips of the arava would, would lean over onto the Mizbeach. So this is not the kind of arava that we're used to seeing putting into our lulav, yes? And so there's nothing like that that we do today uh, outside the Beis HaMikdash. <laughs> However, if you take a look at the Gemara in Sukkah, which is source number two, uh, on Daf Mem Gimel Amid Beis in Sukkah, it seems to be that this is the source of a machlokes. And Amar Lei Rafa Le Rav Yitzchak Berei the Rav Bar Bar Chana Bar Uria, he said, come, uh, uh, you know, the son of the Torah or son of the uh, halacha, and I will come and tell you an important principle. This is actually just a snippet from a much larger discussion in the Gemara and Sukkah Daf Mem Gimel, that Atav Eim Alecha Milsa Ma'al Yasada Avamar come and I'll tell you something really, really quite uh, remarkable that your father said. When the Mishnah says that they would encircle the Mizbeach once on every day of Sukkot and on Hoshana Rabbah, they would encircle it seven times, don't think that they encircled it with the Arava. 
they encircled it with the lulav. And that explains why when we encircle the Mizbeach, we encircle it with uh, a lulav and an esrog instead of using it with an arava. Now, do we encircle the Mizbeach? No, we encircle the Shulchan uh, in the Beis HaKnesses, which is the surrogate for the Mizbeach. So, of course, and that's what we're going to see now when we talk about the Halacha. Um, and that's the, the basis for what we do is with Zechel HaMikdash, we remember what was done in the, in the Beis HaMikdash, and so we go around every Sukkot on a daily basis, except for Shabbos, and we walk around with our Lulav and our Esrog. So what was, what was done with the Arava? According to this opinion in the Gemara, by the way, it's a Machlokas, I'm just giving you one opinion, and it seems to be this is the Halacha Lamaisa, According, uh, according to the, this opinion in the Gemara, they would prop up the Aravas against the Mizbeach and leave them stationary. And then they would hold the Lulavim and the Esrog and they would walk around. So, because we don't have the real Mizbeach, we don't take the, the big Aravas, right? But theoretically, that's what, was, um, that's what could be done if we had a Beis HaMikdash today. Comes along the Shulchan Aruch. We're jumping ahead and then we're going to jump a little backwards. And you'll see why in just a second. First, we need to take a look at the way that the Mechaber codified this halacha. And this is in source number three, the Shulchan Aruch in Hilchas Lulav, with Simen Tafresh Samech, Sif Aleph. The Mechaber is somewhat vague in describing this service that we do in the Beis HaKnesses. He says, Noagim lahalo sefer Torah al habima ula hakifa pamechad b'chol yom. Our minhag is to bring a Sefer Torah up to the Bima, to encircle it once every day, and we encircle, and on, um, and on the seventh day, which is Hoshana Rabbah, we encircle uh, it seven times to remind us of what was done in the Beis HaMikdash. We'll skip the, uh, the Ramah, and, um, and uh, the, 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 he just says, um, mm-hmm. And just, I'm just skipping just a, a couple of words from the Ramah, but it's the Zechel HaMikdash, to remind us what was done in the Beis HaMikdash, where they would encircle the Mizbeach, uh, uh, walking around the altar, and so our Bima, a uh, place where we lane the Torah from, is a surrogate for the Mizbeach, and you were supposed to walk to your right, meaning walk in a clockwise fashion. Counter. 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 No, wait a minute. We do it. Oh, counterclockwise, yeah. So I'll have to think about that. Do we do it clockwise or counterclockwise? We do it counterclockwise. Yeah, we, yeah we, 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 we do it counterclockwise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so let's how you mean, I guess, depends on the orientation of which, which, which way you're facing. All right, but in any event, that's, uh, that's another discussion that we're not going to go into this evening. Okay. Comes with, now, the reason why I wanted you to take a look at the way that the, that the Rav Yosef Kara codifies this is that you'll notice something quite interesting. Simen Tafrei Samech is written in a very um, vanilla, nondescript fashion. Here the Machaber does not tell us at what place in the davening we do these hakafas around the bima. Did you notice that? He doesn't say, Acharei <laughs> HaMusaf or Acharei HaHalel. Yeah. He just says, uh, every day of Sukkot, we just walk around. And he doesn't tell us when in the davening we're supposed to do that. And sort of leaves it up to our imagination, or sort of just basically sidesteps the whole issue. I think that was very deliberate on behalf of the Machaber. We shouldn't think that the Machaber was just being vague for no reason. Sometimes omission is as important as what you commit to writing. You know that for sure from the Rambam. We don't have time to talk about that. It's a very extensive discussion. But sometimes you learn more about the Rambam Shita from the things that he doesn't say than from the things that he does say. And so the Machaber doesn't tell us exactly when to do it. Let's take a look because the Machaber knew the tour, and the tour does discuss this issue. Comes along the tour and he says, uh, uh, the tour is in, is in the beginning of Tafrei Samach, and he starts with the words Va'acharkach. <coughs> so I just included in the brackets, what does the tour mean Va'acharkach? We have to look at Simon Tafrei Shnun Test, the immediately preceding Simon, to know what he's referring to. Simon Tafrei Shnun Test, he just got finished discussing the, t- the davening of Musaf. Okay? And then the tour says explicitly Va'acharkach after Musaf, right? Omer Hoshanas. You say Hoshanas. 
And he says, V'yeshe'in omrim kaddish kodem hoshana. There are some who feel that it's not correct to say kaddish and to create a hefsek between the Shimon Esrei of Musaf and the Hoshanas. Hoshanas really have to be appended immediately and directly to the recital of the Musaf Amida. Now why would that be? Why would that be? Okay, so that's something that we have to examine. V'noa gin if you, um, if, you uh, if you take a look back at the, at the Mishnah um, on source number one, the, um, it says, Bishas Petiras on Mahin Omrin. That's the very last line of that Mishnah. When people would depart, what would they say? Yofilach Mizbeach, Yofilach Mizbeach. Beautiful are you, or beauty to you, Mizbeach, beauty to you, Mizbeach. They were describing their attribution of what they were doing as a beautification of the altar. And the words Bishas Petirasan seems to imply that this was at the end of the daily service. Um, and that's why it seems to the tour, at least as we'll see from the way that the tour is interpreted, as to why it's important to say Hoshanas if we're imitating what was done in the, in the Beis HaMikdash, if it was Bishas Piti when people were leaving, so then that would explain why we do Hoshanas after davening. However, when do we do the Hoshanas uh, in, in the, in the, in the Beis HaMikdash? It has to be, it seems to be, at a time when they're offering Karbanos. So if it's at a time when they're offering Karbanos, then or shortly either before or after, it seems to be after because it says Bishas Petiras, and it's at the end of the morning <laughs> service after they've offered the Karban Musaf. So then saying Kaddish after the Ishman Esrei, which is the surrogate for, for the Karban Musaf, would be a Hefzik. And therefore that's the reason why you shouldn't say Kaddish after Musaf, after the Chazar Sashats, but you should instead go directly into Hoshanas. Okay? And the tour just gives us the background information which we've already seen that we do this to remind ourselves of what was done in the Beit HaMikdash. Now, if you take a look at the bottom two lines of the tour, he says, the Rafsadja Kosav, now he quotes Rafsadja Gon, and he brings us a different minhag of when to do Hoshanas. He says, the Rafsadja Kosav, Shemakifan Miyad Achar Kriya Sahav Torah, that you're supposed to encircle the Bima, not after the Chazor Sashats of Mosav, but after you read the Haftorah. After you read the Haftorah for the day, um, and Ba'od HaSefer Al Hateva, while the Sefer Torah is still on the Bima. Now it seems from the way that it, this is written that Rav Sadu Gon is telling us a reason why you should do this immediately after Kriya Satora. Because there's, you shouldn't unnecessarily take out a Sefer Torah. If the Sefer Torah is already out there, then it's appropriate at that point to say Hoshana so that you don't need to take out the Sefer Torah for no reason another time. It's a sense, it's a, we should feel a sense of honor or respect to the Sefer Torah that we don't want to just, you know, willy-nilly just take it out, out back and forth, in and out, in and out. If it's already out, that's when you should say Hoshanas. Aye, what about the fact that there's a certain imperative to imitate what was done in the Beis HaMikdash, and if there's a connection between the Hoshanas and the Korban Musaf, so how do you create that connection if you're doing it after Kriya Satora? Well, the answer is simple, because w during Sukkot, our Kriya Satora is the, the Korbanos that were brought, the Korbanos Musaf that were brought uh, in the Beis HaMikdash. So this opinion, Rav Saja would have to, would, would acknowledge that there is a connection that you're creating between the sacrificial service and the Hoshanas, but instead of doing it by appending it to the tefillah of Musaf, you append it to the Kriya of the carbon Musaf that's contained in the Kriya Satora. Okay? And I'm, I'm speaking out to you now a lot of stuff that is discussed by the later Achronim to explain what the, the basis of these Machlokasim are. Where is the requirement that a Torah has to be part of? It? Has to be part of. It? 
Well, that, that, that's, a, that's a good question. The, the assumption is that the Torah sort of acts, with, when the Torah is there, it acts as the surrogate for the Mizbeach. Because God apparently comes down onto the Mizbeach to imbibe the Reach Nichoach, the, the savory fragrance of the Karbanos, and therefore the Torah represents God's presence or coming down, I would imagine, uh, to, uh, you know, when we have, when we're doing our Hakafas. Um, by the way, the Gemara discusses, the Gemara in Tainus, I believe, says that Avram Avinu, when he said, he said, Hashem, how am I supposed to know that I'm going to inherit the land? Hashem says, don't worry if the Jewish people ever sin, they'll have the Seder HaKarbanos, they'll have the order of the sacrifices to help atone for their sins. So then the Gemara records Avraham Avinu saying, well, that's all well and good when there are karbanos, but when the temple is destroyed, there are no karbanos, what are we going to do? So Hashem says, you'll read the karbanos from a Sefer Torah, and that will act as the surrogate for the karbanos. So that would also explain why you need a Sefer Torah, because the Sefer Torah contains the reading of the karbanos, and therefore you need that present in order to really recreate that sense of the Mizbeach. In any event, um, um, so Boza. Uh, so Rav, 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 the tour says that I agree with Rav Sadja, it's a good idea because it, it, it obviates the unnecessary removal of a Torah from the Ark when you're not going to read from it. However, he says, that's not the minhag. That's not the minhag. And even though I, I see the logic behind what Rav Sadja is saying, we don't do it if it's not the minhag. Now, this practice is not what is done, I have never seen this done by anyone, to do Hoshanas after the reading of the Haftorah. There are two predominant minhagim in the world today, in the Welt today. One is Nusach, prim, primarily Nusach Ashkenaz, which is the, the minhag is to do Hoshanas after Musaf. And the other one is what's mostly done by Nusach Sfard, although some Nusach Ashkenaz shuls do this as well, to do the Hoshanas after Halel, or already holding the Lulav in the Esri. And so we have yet to see anything in the tour. The tour doesn't talk about that minhag at all. Okay, and so where does that come from? So let's take a look first of all at the Bach. Could we? Yeah. Could we suggest that the that the Shulchan Aruch didn't necessarily disagree? In other words, he's working with the tour, and therefore <coughs> the the omission here is that he acknowledges the, the fact that that's the minhag of the tour. So therefore, that's of course a shot. What? Explain. Words, I, I didn't follow. He was, he was saying that he doesn't designate. He's he's part. Mm -hmm. Right. Why? Yeah. Perhaps his omission is that he's actually just going like the sheets of the tour, which is what he would follow. Well, then why does he leave out the words ve'achar? Why doesn't? He, why does he leave out the words ve'achar? <coughs> he's because he's going on. The, he's he's working with the. With the yeah, tour. but the but the Shulchan Aruch generally, the Machaber generally doesn't assume that we know the tour. When the when the Rav Yosef Kara wrote the Shulchan Aruch, he wasn't thinking that I know my reader will learn the tour before he learns me, so anything that I leave out, will, you'll fill in the blanks by looking at the tour. It's generally not the way he operates. It's supposed to be a self-contained work. Okay, take a look at the Bach. The Bach says, Okay, like we said before, don't say Kaddish before Hoshanas. Um, and then he gives us the background information as to why we say it based upon the Mishnah, just like we had seen. Um, and then he quotes the Gemara and Daf Mem Gimel that we had already seen whether or not you circle the, um, the Mizbeach with a Lulav or whether you circle the Mizbeach with an Arava. So he says, but we go like the Mandomer who says, Lulav, Lufichach Nogin, Lahakif, Lulav, Kol Shiva. And we say, Hoshana Zechel, Mikdash. And then he says, he says, um, he says, Umeacher Sha'osa HaHakafo, we're on the fourth line of the Bach. He says, "Ume acher shosa ha'akafah should be mikdash haisa acher hakrovis korban musaf." He says, "Because the offering of the, um, uh, the, the the encircling was done after the offering of the korban musaf, the spalot filas musaf and kedemashim and mitnad b'shas petiras and mahalu omrim yofi lach misbeach." He says, "And the diuk is from the Mishnah, like I, I pointed out to you before. The alma should take up acher ha'akafah and if through v'holchulam that immediately after hoshanas were over, they went home." Because it says Bishas Piti Rasa. So Afano Osim came. And that's what we do as well. He says, um, and um, 
he says, and then he just discusses further whether it's appropriate to say the Hoshanas after Kaddish or before Kaddish, and the minog that we have is to say Hoshanas before Kaddish. Fine. Now, before we get to the sources of saying uh, Hoshanas after Hallel, I just want to observe something quite fascinating. If we are trying to replicate in some way the practice that was done in the Beis HaMikdash, I have a very simple question, a very, very, and it's a very obvious question when you think of it. <clears throat> who was allowed, who in the Beis HaMikdash was circling the Mizbeach every day? It was the Kohanim. Because as many of us know, the Mishnayas are quite explicit when they tell us that there's only a, there's a pr certain part of the Azara, of the temple courtyard, that's known as Ezra Sisrael. And another part that's known as the Ezra uh, Kohanim, or the Ezra Slavia, all right? But there's a certain part where Yisrael is not allowed to trespass on. And I think it's the first 11 Amas, I think, of the Ezra Sisra, of the Azara, is where the Yisraelim are allowed to stand. But certainly, a Yisrael is not allowed to go between the Mizbeach and the entrance to the Heichal. That's not permitted. So if we're trying to imitate and to emulate what was done in the Beis HaMikdash, should there not be a rule that only Kohanim are allowed to do uh, the, uh, the Hoshanas and walk around? So of course you think that this is, you know, only a Kohen would come up with that kasha. <laughs> but, uh, but this is not, this is not my own kasha. This is some, of, some, of, some of the Achronim asked this question. And there's a huge debate, by the way, as to how to answer this question. What did you want to say, Shmuel? I just, yeah, it's just that a Yisrael is not confined to 11 Amas when he has a carbon. Mm -hmm. He's allowed to go to the Mizbeach and put his hands on the carbon. Oh, really? The smicha is done? The smicha is done. It says, take up the, the, take up the sheet of the smicha. Ah, okay. All right. That's a very, that's a very good idea, a very good observation. That, it, it's interesting. I didn't see that brought up in the context of this discussion, but that's a very, very interesting point. Um, uh, in in Ratzif Pesach Frank say from Mikroy Kodesh, his son, who writes the footnotes to the Sefer, brings down these, this question, and he observes that there are a number of different ways of answering it. Some say, like Shmuel is suggesting, that there were certain exceptions as to, where, as to when the, the Yisraelim were, were allowed to or not allowed to go beyond that point. And for Hoshanas, for the Hakafa around the Mizbeach, the rule that Yisraelim were not allowed to encircle was suspended. And therefore, the Yisraelim were allowed to walk around the Mizbeach. But he brings it up from another sheet of the Achronim that says, no, that the rule was instituted, and that when it says, Makif b'chol yom makifin, <coughs> it is Taka referring to the Kohanim. Or, and he brings in a third uh, explanation that says that when, the, the, when it says Makifin, it doesn't mean that they would walk around, but rather that they would stand around the Mizbeach with the Yisraelim standing within their parameters of the Ezra Yisrael, and the Kohanim standing on the side of the Mizbeach where they, you know, further in where they were allowed to stand. And it just means the word Makifin doesn't mean walking around the way we do, but they would just stand at stationary. They would just form a circle, exactly. And so, but that doesn't seem to be consistent with the way we do it. Yeah? When you look at the things we do Zechel Amikdash. Yeah. It isn't confined to what it used to be. It's everybody, like taking an 11 echo off to the first day. Right, Alex, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, No, that's, that's, that, I think that's a valid it's point. I think that one, one could argue that Zechel Amikdash doesn't necessarily have to be an exact duplication with all of the limitations that existed in the Beis HaMikdash. It could be that Zechel Amikdash means a reminder to ourselves of our desire to rebuild the Beis HaMikdash and that we do so with such intensity that even those who originally were not permitted to walk around the Mizbeach, we do so now to show our tremendous desire to rebuild the Temple. That could be a, a, a shot as well. But it's just something to bear in mind that it's, uh, it's like, like an obvious kasha, you know, like the, the, only the Kohanim were doing this. Yeah. Were there not times during the year where they opened up the, the, the Ulam so that, so that people could see the, uh, the Kalim inside? Yeah, but you could see that even from a distance. You could see that from you didn't have to go up to the you didn't have to go up to the to the entrance. You weren't allowed to. They didn't allow people to come up. You would see it from a distance because it was a huge door. It was a huge doorway. You know. You so, see other way 
and in which case the question would still stand is the point that Shmuel made, you can go up to the Mizbeach, but only from one side. I still don't think you were allowed to because the Mizbeach was positioned. Yeah, I saw, yeah, so I'm not sure about that. Shmuel, I, have to, I, I haven't seen that in the, in the context of this discussion, but it's an interesting horror. We'd have to think about that. Yeah, and it, even so, they still were not allowed to see the blue and the Mizbeach. Right, that's right. My, that's my okay. point. So you still that's that's what there, Simi right? is saying, yeah. Okay, so the earliest source that I've seen for saying Hoshanas after Hallel is from the 17th century. It was written by the Rishon Litzion, who was the Sephardic chief rabbi of Yerushalayim, of Eretz Yisrael. Even in the 17th century, they had a Rishon Litzion, right? And it was uh, um, Harav Moshe Galanti who talks about what the Min of Yerushalayim was. So let's see what he says. He says, writes, I apologize for the difficult uh, font, but this probably is an original printing from the 1600s, and it was the only copy that I could find on the Hebrewbooks.org, but because I don't possess my own copy. But he writes as follows: He says, "B'machlokes shehaya or mahaya bein rabbanei zemanenu zal be'inyan ha'hoshanos." He says, regarding this is in Simon Pei Vav in his Sefer Korban Chagiga of the Maram Galanti. And he says, nowadays we note that there is a, a machlokis among the rabbis of our time. Shebechol makom osin hakafos achar musaf. He says, in all other places around the world, they do the, they do the hakafos, the hoshanas after musaf. Upo Yerushalayim, your hakodesh. Tibane v'sikane in b'meira b'yameinu. That he says, but here in Yerushalayim, your hakodesh may be speedily rebuilt. Nagu b'kineses hagidola. The, the, maybe it's the Talmud Torahs, uh, the Talmud, Talmud Torahs, or maybe other, they, uh, he says, in the large synagogue, in the great synagogue in Yerushalayim, and I don't know what the great synagogue was in Yerushalayim, there must have been a great synagogue in Yerushalayim in the 17th century, and all other, I guess, and all other shuls, la'asosam acher ha'halel, to do it after halel. Ve'he'idu shekach no'agu bizman rabbanei uga'onei olam. And there is some kind of Kabbalah or Masorah that they have that this was done going all the way back to the really the early Gaonim. But also Hahaskama Shiyasu Kimin Hagam Achar Hahalel, Viroi Levakesh Zivara, Viraya O Remez Lazem. He says, and we really sh really should try and find the reason why this is done after Halel. Right? We have to try and figure out why is this done after Halel. And I see that there is a raya from the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah. So instead of trying us to read this very, very difficult font, I printed for you the Gemara. It's a Mishnah in Gemara in Rosh Hashanah, Daf Lamed Beis Amadei. So let's keep our finger on the uh, Sefer Korban Chagiga in source number seven for a second, and just jump up to source number six and take a look at the Mishnah. The Mishnah says in Maseches Rosh Hashanah, Daf Lamed Beis Amid Beis, that when it comes time to know when to blow shofar in Rosh Hashanah, the Vesheni, which is the Shliach Tzibur who's leading Musaf, that's when you blow shofar. You don't blow shofar during Shacharis, you blow shofar during Musaf. We all know that, right? But this is the, the Mishnah which institutes this idea. And Uvishas Halel Harishon Mekareyat Halel. But for Hallel's recitation, the guy leading Shacharis, the Shlich Tzibur of Shacharis, he's the one that leads Hallel. Now, the question you may ask is, why is it that for Rosh Hashanah, Tkia Shofar is in Musaf, and on, all of, on days when we say Hallel, Hallel is said in Shacharis. So this is what the Gemara wants to try and analyze. The Gemara says, Maishna Sheni Maskia, why is it? that on Rosh Hashanah you blow shofar during Musaf and not during Shacharis? The answer is Mishum de Barovam, Hadris Melech. The very famous principle is that you want to give glory to the king when the, the uh, majority of the people are there. And so you wait until most people have come to Shul, which is in Musaf. Yes? Okay. So the Gemara now says, so that, right? So, okay, so people came to Shul even late, even in the times of the Gemara. <laughs> Is it the women? No, lots of the women are putter from Tkia Shofar. I don't know if they always came to the base. I don't know. I don't. I don't know that it's necessary addressing the women. No, I don't think so. I think the Gemara, when it talks, by the way, what? They accepted that one, even though even though not supposed to, they accepted 
Lake Shore for Toulouse, Lake Shore for that My understanding. I, I thought the uh, the whole uh, Musa uh, blowing in Musa was because of the Masa Shah. Yeah. Yeah. The Shema. Mm -hmm. The inspector. Oh, okay. One second. One second. One second. We're gonna get there in just a second. Oh, it's in the Bible too. Hold on. Hold on. Mishum de Barovam Hadras Melech. Hold on a second. Ihachi Halel Nami Nema Bisheni. So then the question is, is the if is it an imperative of Barovam Hadras Melech? So then why don't we wait until Musaf to say Halel? Wouldn't that be great? You know, I feel bad for the Shleif Kibur of Shacharis. You know, he prepares so many Nigunim and so many songs, and he's only got a, a, a the shul's only a third or a half full by the time he's ready to, to really belt out his uh, Kalbach Nigunim and all that stuff. Wouldn't it be much better if the guy reciting Halel could do it in a, with a packed house when everyone's there? Wouldn't that be much better? That's for the Gemara's question, right? So the Gemara says... Mishum de Barovam, I just know. So Ella, Maishna Halo de Barishon, Mishum de Zrizin, Makdimen, Lamitzvis. So, what's the reason why you have to say Halel uh, with, with the Bal Shacharis? Because there's a counter imperative to Barovam Hadras Melech. There are two imperatives or two sort of um, ideals that the Gemara says exist in a vacuum. One is Barovam Hadras Melech, that when you do a mitzvah, it's more honorable to do the mitzvah with a, with a larger multitude. But there's a counter imperative, which is it's reason Makdimil Mitzvah. You have an opportunity to wait an hour or to do it now. You should always do a mitzvah as early as in the day as possible. So you have these two things that are at, that are uh, opposing forces. And for what therefore, when it comes to Halel, we apply <coughs> reason Makdimil Mitzvah to say Halel earlier instead of later. So the Gemara says, well, Tkiyonami Navid Barisham. Well, then why don't you blow Shofar based on the imperative of Zrizin Makdim and Lemitzvahs? Right? The Gemara answers, Amar B'yechanan Bishmas Jibishas Hashma Adashon. Answers the Gemara because this was instituted at a time of Shmad, uh, that Tkiyah Shofar originally at one point in our history was banned by external persecuting forces. And as a result, we had to wait later in the day before we could blow Shofar. And once it was placed there, we left it there, right? But we're, now, the diuk that the, the Rav Galanti is going to be able to make from this Gemara is what? So a very, a very fascinating diuk. When you have two opposing forces of Zrizin Makdimen versus Barovam, which one trumps which? Zrizin. Zrizin Makdimen, because if it were not for the, for the issue of Shas Hashmad, then Zrizin, we would, the imperative would be to say both Alel and Kiyashofer in Shacharis, not in Musa. Oh. So now, how does that relate to Hoshanas? Okay, so let's go. Yeah. Don't we have a principle of Davening? Was it Tadir Vajena, Tadir Tadir Kainan? No, no, no. Tadir Vajena Tadir is only applied when you have two mitzvahs to do. Not when you have one mitzvah. When you have two mitzvahs to do, which one takes precedence over the other? You have, Tudor does you have an order for davening. You do Tudor you first, and Shana Tudor you, you do far. Yeah, you don't. You do it in a certain order. You always. Yeah. You, know, you do most of the after chakras because you always do chakras and most of the yes, on. Correct. So, so correct. I'm surprised they don't mention that in here. Isn't no, because Oshanis is not a tefillah. Oshanis is a mitzvah, just like just like tekiya shofar, right? Or halal. It's it's not it's not a prayer service. It's a it's an expression or it's an act. A mitzvah that we do in the course of our tefillah. Right? Is Hoshanis a mitzvah or is it a minah? What's that? Is Hoshanis a mitzvah or a minah? Uh, okay, in other words, yeah, whatever, whatever you want to call it. It is a rabbinically instituted practice, <laughs> right? And the, the rabbi said, do it, right? So the question is, where in tefillah do we do it? Just like tekiah shofar. So we should really do tekiah shofar and shacharis, just like we do halal and shacharis. But because of shmad, we pushed it off to Musaf, and we keep it there because once we once it's there, then we can rely on Barov Amhadras Melech to keep it there. But the Chathila, if we're thinking about where to put it, we should put it, we should use the principle of Zrizin Makdim and to put it earlier, if we if all things were 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 equal. Let, now let's go back to Rav Galanti in the Korban Chagiga and let's see what he says. He says he says what's the diak that he makes from the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah? He says the Afal got the Ikas Svarat the Barov Amhadras Melech he says, even though there's, a, there's an imperative of Barovam Hadras Melech, which would tell us that, you know what, we should recite Halel 
when the masses are already assembled? Why do we do halal so early as to do it before Kriya Satora? In Kolze Asiku de Yoseroi, Leo Sakol Bishacharis Mishum's reason Makdim and Lemitzvahs. But yet, there's a greater imperative than Barovam, which was reason Makdimin. So, Ella de Hivikia Acharuha, or or de, de, I think it's really de Kavauha. I think there's a, there's a little bit of a, of a, a misprint there. It says de Kavauha Achareha Mipne Hashmad. He says the only reason they put Tkia Shofar after. Uh, after Kriya Satora is because of Shmad. The Ayin Shom, the Kibin Shekein Adover, Bore Las or Shoy Las is called Mitzvah Sayom B'Shacharis Yim Ahalil. Mishum's reason Makdimin. He says then it would turn out that based upon the conclusion of the Gemara, any Mitzvah that you do in the course of davening should be done in Shacharis and not in Musa. The Das Hamaacharim Mishum De Barovam Hadris Melech Ach Maskanas Hagemara Eina King. I certainly acknowledge that the reason why people do Hoshanas after Musaf is because that's when the largest assemblage of people is there. But that's not the maskan of the Gemara. The Gemara seems to be, uh, seems to be coming out that's reason Makdimen is a greater imperative than Baro Vam. Yes? You have, you have another issue, though, and that is if you're trying to imitate the Nikdash. And Hoshanas are always done after Musaf. Oh, once, oh, that's a good point, Shmuel. Shmuel raises an excellent point. What about the fact that there's supposed to be some adjacency between the Hoshanas and the Korban Musaf? And you don't have that when you're davening shacharis. Hold on to your hats. We're going to get to that. All right. It's a good, it's a very good point. He says, and then the korban chagiga says further. He says, "Va'od ani omer da filu man da azul basa barovam." He says, "Hainu davka la'achar matan Torah kodem musaf." He says, even if you're going to argue that barovam hadras melech is an imperative to to cause you to delay saying hoshanas. He says, but that should only be after the Torah reading, before you dab in Musaf. Shaz heim ne esafim mipnei ha Torah, the ha Musaf. Avo le kihilo shem achren osam achar tiskabel de Musaf, ro anochi shelo yafe himosin. Ki achar ha Musaf holchem kulam ish le darko. He says, I don't think it's appropriate to wait until all the way until the end of davening to do Hoshanas. That's when everyone's trying to run out of shul. Things haven't changed very much, right? right? He says, that's not a good time to do Hoshanas. If you're going to wait to do Hoshanas, to wait till more people come, okay, fine, I can understand waiting till after Kriya Satora. But don't do it after Musaf and after Kaddish, because then people are already running out. Um, he says, he says, Ba'avu no Seinu, he says, in our, in our sins. The kach shamati sheish makamo shaosin osim kodam musaf acha kriya sator lefi shem and mekubat simu mamtinim sham lo musaf. And he says, I've heard, and of course he's quoting Rav, Rav Sadji Gon's minhag that the Torah quoted as well, I've heard that there are certain minhagim where they do hoshanas after kriya sator. Ach mana ase she rabbeinu ha b'shulchan aruch of the Torah lo an harlan ayinin v'azli basim minhage I think it's Sarfas la asosa achar musach, ach minhag yir kodesh yirushalayim, minhag vasikin hu, and vidok, and I don't know what that acronym is. But he says, basically, he says, look, he says, the Shulchan Aruch doesn't bring down the minhag yirushalayim. They bring down the minhag that was done in France, which was to do it after Musaf, even though I don't agree that that's the proper place to do it. But, what, but at the end of the day, minhag yirushalayim is to do it after Halil, and we're very comfortable with minhag yirushalayim. That's, and because that's where he lives. So fine. So that explains that. Let's take a look now at our final source, which is, um, first of all, in the sh you should know this is, not, this is not ignored. The Maram Galanti is a very important early Achron that needs to be contended with, and the Shari Tshuva does bring him down. The Shari Tshuva brings it down in Simon Tafre Shnun Aleph, not in Simon Tafre Samet. So you should know that it's even brought down. You don't put up a standard Mishnah Bura, you'll find the Maram Galanti over there. And now let's take a look at Rav Yaakov Etlinger, the Machaber of the Orach Lanair, and, uh, and the Shul Shal Shuvas Bin Yansi, and he wrote an entire sefer just on Hilchas Sukkot called the Bikurei Yaakov. And here he has a tshuva about the time when you're supposed to do Hakafas. So comes along and he says as follows, Vihine. Zman ha hakafa lo nisbar b'shulchan aruch im koida musaf o achar musaf. He says the shulchan aruch doesn't tell us whether you're supposed to do it before or after musaf the hakafos. And vahatur hevi b'shem reb sadi shemakif in koida musaf because of sheminag nacham v'ushaloi tzarech lahotze shum sefer Torah alchin and alashay no again came. The tour quotes reb sadi who says to do it after the haftorah so that you won't have to take out a sefer Torah for no reason, without reading from it. 
but that's not the minhag, and therefore we stick with the minhag um, of the Klal Yisrael, which is to do it after Musa. Ba'abach heret lahochiach keminagenu, demashmi v'maslisim delachar hakafosin patru mehamizbech v'amru yofi loch mizbech. And then he quotes the Bach, who says that I can prove to you from the language of the Mishnah that they did it at the end of the, of the temple service in the morning, because it says, Bishas Petiras, and as they were leaving, after they finished, it seems like the last service of the day was the Hoshanas, was the Hakafa of the, uh, of the Mizbeach. Bizal Karcha Musaf, and that must have been after Musaf. Then he quotes the Chemdas Yomim, and, uh, and he quotes the Mina Gavanshe Yerushalayim, to do the Hakafa immediately after Halel. And veherich lo hochiach da adini mohem da afti yesvar la acher ad acher musaf mishum derova mikol makom muchach berosh hashana disvar this reason makdimen adif mi berova. So just just like we saw, and um, so now he says let's let's just skip down where you see the period over there. Avo beemes nira la nias daiti. See that we're in the just in the middle of the tshuva. Says <coughs> Rav Etlinger as follows. Avo beemes nira la nias daiti lo hochiach ipcha. He says, however, I would like to argue just the opposite to what the Bach was saying, that the Hakafos were done in the Beis HaMikdash after Musa. I would like to argue that I can demonstrate that even like the Maram Galanti, there is a source to show that what saying the Hakafos after Halel is actually rooted in the practice that was done in the Beis HaMikdash. How's that? The B'Mikdash HaYagam Ken Kodam Musa. In the Beis Hamikdash, they also did the Hakafas after Musaf. Lefima I'm sorry, before before Musaf. Lefima shekosav Rashi besukah l'shita sayish omrim dezikifas arava beis nisach hamayim haya. Take a look at Rashi. He says in Masecha Sukkah Daf Nun Dalid, and Rashi says, at least according to one opinion, that when did they do? the uh, propping up of the willow branches against the Mizbech, as is described in the Mishnah, they did it at the time when they did the water pouring, the water libation, the Nisuch HaMayim. V'kasaf tisham b'chidushi, dur b'chidushai, da'al karachach kein higam kein da'as ha-rambam, sh'posak sh'token b'eis Nisuch HaMayim, u'posak sh'token b'sha'as b'eis ikifas ha-rava. The Rambam paskins that they blew the shofar both at the time of Nisuch HaMayim and also at the time when they did the propping up of the arava. He says, and you have to, in order for the number of tekios that are discussed in the Mishnah that they did on Sukkot to come out to a total of 48, which is the number that is given in the Mishnah, you have to say that the tekiah shofar blowing that was done at the time of Nisa Chamayim and the tekiah shofar blowing that was done at the time they propped up the Arava was one and the same. Because otherwise you're going to end up with 51 tekios instead of 48 tekios. The Amin and Besuka, the Nisa Chamayim Hayabe Es Nisa Chayayin Shel Atomid Shel Shachar, and and when did they do the Nisa Chamayim? They did the Nisa Chamayim at the time when they did the Nisa Chayayin, when they did the wine libation on a daily basis. When did they do the wine libation? When they offered the Tamid Shel Shachar, when they offered the daily Tamid offering. Daily Tamid offering corresponds to which prayer service? Shacharis. And the Gemara in Yoma also says that all the libations precede the Korban Musaf. And it says it's very clear that when did they daven Musaf in the temple? After they offered the Korban Musaf. When did they do the Hakafa? Right after they propped up the Arava. Okay. And when did they do the Arava propping? At the time when they did the Nisa Chamayim. The Nisa Chamayim based Nisa Chayayim. And that was then when they did the wine libation. The Tamid, of the daily Tamid. The Nisa Chodem Lemusafim. And that was done, therefore, before the offering of the Korban Musaf. And Musafim Kodem Lemusafim Kodem Lemusafim. And the offering of the Korban Musaf was done before the prayer of the Musaf. Okay. And Bemikdash Hayu Makif and Kodem Lemusafim Kenu Adin Ladidan. And therefore, says Rav Yaakov Etlinger, if so, then in reality, they circled the Mizbeach before the Karban Musaf, and that's what we should do in our synagogues as well. Humasha hochiach ha-bach she-bisha p'tirasan, I, what do you do about the Bach's diuk from the Mishnah? Bishas p'tiratan, which implies that they only did the Hoshanas at the very end of the service. What are you going to do with that? 
says, he says, Yesh lomar shazah ya'achar petiras kol ha'avodos. Velo ba'osos man ke Moshe Kosov hu ba'atzim l'shitas Rav Sadja. He says, one answer could be that the, the Rav Sadja Gon is going to have the same question, because remember, Rav Sadja Gon's practice was to do Hoshanas after the Haftorah. So what are, you, what are you going to say about the language of Bishas Petira, son? So the answer is, is that when the Mishnah says Bishat Petira Tan, it doesn't mean immediately after Hoshanas. They did the Hoshanas before Musaf, and then dot, 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 they, they offered the Musaf, and they did all they, they did the, the Tfilas Musaf, and they did all the Karbanos for Musaf, and then Bishas Petira Tan, then later in the day, right, when they were about to leave, they would say, Yofi Lach Mizbeach, Yofi Lach Mizbeach. Okay? Inami Yesh Lomar. Another answer could be, Delachar Petira San, Mi Karban Tamid Shel Shachar Amrukein. Another explanation could be that when the Mishnah says, Bishat Petira Tan, when they would depart, it means upon their departure from the Karban Tamid, not from the entire morning service. That could also mean what Bishat Petira Tan means. Because after all, they would offer the carbon and then they would daven. Then they would offer the carbon musaf and then they would daven filas musaf. So therefore, bishas betiras means they would pull away from the mizbeach for a little while to daven and then they would come back later. So bishas betiras could mean when they would leave the mizbeach after the tamid shal shachar. The chalamrinu besuko. Lenias daiti raya shekasafti machraasi keminig anshe yerushalayim. And therefore, he says, it seems to me that my argument is clearly <coughs> demonstrates that the Minag Yerushalayim is the more correct minhag, that one should therefore say Hoshanas after Hallel. Comes along the, uh, the Bikurei Yaakov and says, even though we don't have the ability to change any minhag, if you come to Shul and there's no davening nusuch sfar, and you come and you discover, hey, they're doing Hoshanas after Hallel. What's going on? These crazy people, right? Yakifimahim, Afshalo Hispalaladai in Musaf. Then you should, and let's say, or you come to a shul late, and they're davening Nusach Ashkenaz, and they're already started Hoshanas, and you got a hangover because you woke up, right? And whatever. You went to someone's Simchas Beis Hashoeva the night before, and it was a wild party, and you get to shul really late and party after Musaf. So you haven't daven Musaf yet, so you know what? You should still do Hoshanas together with the shul. He says, the other rabbi, ha hakava yeshla ikar yosir kodem Musaf. He says, don't think that you need to daven Musaf before you do the hakava. You can actually do the hakava before Musaf because in reality, there's an, there's an, a, 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 there's a, a, the way I explained it, there's an imperative taka to do the hakafas before Musaf. So there's, a, there's something to be said about circling the shulchan before Musaf. He doesn't say what happens if you woke up relate. You didn't even daven shacharis yet. That he doesn't discuss. I don't think that he's advocating that if you haven't davened at all, you should do the uh, you should do the hoshanas with the tzibur. I think all he's saying is that if you daven shacharis but you haven't davened musaf yet, it's not a problem. Just you know you can do the you can do the hoshanas already with them. Okay. So just to wrap up, we have three different minhagim that are that are discussed. Two are discussed by the tour. One is the Tours Minog, which is identified by the Korban Chagiga of Galanti as the Minog Tsarfas, as the custom that was done in France, which is the, um, I have one more, by the way, I have one more thing to share with you, which I didn't, this is in a separate uh, handout. What, one is um, uh, the, the, the Minog of France, which is do it after Musaf, based upon the fact, like the Bach's Diuk, that they would say, it says in the Mishnah Bishas Petit Rasan, which implies that this was the last thing done in the temple service. We have the Minig of Rabsajigom, who says that it's not proper to take out a Sefer Torah when you're not going to be reading from it, and therefore you should only do Hoshanas when the Sefer Torah is already out, which is after the reading of the Haftorah. And then we have the Minig Yerushalayim, which is to say that's reason Makdim el Mitzvah is an imperative, and therefore you should say it immediately after Hallel. I, what about the fact that you want to emulate temple service? So Rav Yaakov Etlinger says that Taka does emulate temple service because they really actually did the Hakafas not after Musaf, but rather they did the hakafas after the Tamil Shal at the time of the Nisa Hamai. Okay, so where does that leave us? Um, and I don't, I don't even know whether this is going to make it to kosher tube yet. Um, the question is, so wh what should someone do if they're davening in a shul and they find Rav Yaakov Etlinger's argument very convincing? So should there be a campaign that we should change it? <laughs> what, about, what about the issue of the Tircha Din Sibura? What about the fact that in a, in a large base where you don't have a lot of room to move about, 
there is this issue to, there's something to be said about the fact that it's a big tircha for people to have to take out the little of an Esra once for Hallel, put it away, and then wait a little while, and then later on in the service take it out again, out of the tin foil, out of the wrappings, and all the et cetera, et cetera, in order to say Hoshanas afterwards. So first of all, you have to realize that there is value to Barov on Hadras Melech. You know, it's, you have to m make sure we understand the Gemara. The Gemara is not saying that there's no value to Barov on Hadras Melech. It's that it's trumped by his reason Magdimit. But if already there's, an, there's already an existent minhag, like we saw before because of Shas Hashmat, that there was already a pre-instituted minhag, and the, there's a benefit of Barovan because now everyone sees the beautiful uh, Hoshanas that are being done now by hundreds of men instead of perhaps only uh, 70, 80, 90 men, so then that's something that we have to, we, we can't really just easily discard if that's already the minhag. Take a look if you, if you want. I didn't include it in the original packet, but it's worthwhile taking a look at. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein has a tshuv in Igris Moshe, specifically on the issue of changing the hagim of a Beisach Nessus. And this should be actually part of a much larger shear, which one day Emir Tzushem will, will explore. I don't know if I have enough... Uh, Assuming you're closing the door, where this is like private or something? Oh, no, no. <laughs> anyway. Roma. Rav Moshe has a tshuva. Uh, we just have another couple minutes. Rav Moshe has a tshuva about what to do if the, if, the, um, if the demographics, if the population of a shul begins to shift. You know, like it's not, you don't say, oh, no, there goes the neighborhood because the, <laughs> the blacks are moving in or some other minorities moving in. That's not the issue. The issue is that you have a dilemma that the Nusach Sfard guys are moving in, right? Oh no, there goes the neighborhood, right? We had a beautiful Nusach Ashkenaz shul, and all of a sudden a bunch of Hasidim have come in, or a bunch of Hungarians have come into the shul, right? And they start, they say, you know, hey, our minhag, our minhag is to do Hoshanas immediately after Howell. What are you doing? These crazy uh, German, German Jews, they don't know what they're talking about. Why are you doing Hoshanas all the way after Musaf? And they want to change various minhagim of the shul. We have another issue. What about, and Rav Moshe goes through a number of different uh, what ifs, another number of different examples. The minhag of the shul, let's say, is not to say Ladovid Mizmor after, after Mariv, Leil Rosh Hashanah, right? What if a bunch of people, now the, the demographics of the shul have shifted and a bunch of guys come back from yeshiva and they say, in our yeshiva they always said Ladovid Mizmor. What's going on over here? You know, so the Mizmor, what is this crazy minhag, right? And they want to change the minhag of the shul. So Rav Moshe addresses an, a few different examples of this, as under what conditions you're allowed to and what conditions you're not allowed to change the minhagim of the shul. So Rav Moshe addresses this and he says, um, and he says, "Bedaver makom Hashem in Hagayim benusach Ashkenaz, avol mikiven shebe Medina zu darim bechol seviva gam anoshim shem in Hagayim benusach Sfarim mispalm gankim bebeisak nesezeh." He says the minig, the official nusach of the shul is nusach Ashkenaz. He says, but there are the larger community has a lot of people who daven nusach Sfarim who come to daven in the shul. And he goes, "Meshech hayomim meizem in Hagayim shenogim b'hem mispalm in benusach Sfarim." So therefore. The shul has sort of adopted certain minhagim of Nusach Svard in addition to Nusach Ashkenaz. And they, what they want to know, is this the right thing to do? He says, if you still have a majority of the mispaulim in the shul who are Nusach Ashkenaz, then it's certainly not appropriate to sort of start switching things around willy-nilly without doing it uh, you know, with the majority's uh, endorsement. He says, even if you were to able to get a majority vote of people who want to change to Nusach Sfard, he says, He says, yes, but what are you going to do about the, the founders of the shul who really instituted Nusach Even if they're the minority, you still have to reckon with them. Even if they're the minority, you still have to reckon with them. And he says, and he quotes from the Chavos Yoyer, this is only if the entire original founding body of the shul is now gone. It's a whole new group of people that are of a different nusach. Only then can you start arguing that you can change the minhagim of the shul. But if there's still a remnant of people 
who have that original nusach, you're not allowed to change. Etc., etc., etc. He says there is a prevailing minhag of the makam that has to be respected and observed. So, Consul, take a look at the next paragraph. And this, this I, I, it clear, I readily admit that we are just parsing over this in a cursory fashion. This really deserves to have its own shear. Rav Moshe makes a distinction as follows. He says, if there are new practices that do not contradict the previous minhagim, he says, if the previous minhag was just not to do certain things, not to say certain things, and now they want to come along and say certain things, that, of course, you have the right to do. But there you need the, the haskama of the Rav in order to be able to add, let's say, something new to the Davin. Like we added Borchi Nafshi on Rosh Chodesh, even though the previous minute was not to add Borchi Nafshi. It's based on this truth of Ramosha, that if there's a desire in the Kehila to add a certain fila, that's not called changing the minha. Changing the minhag means to reposition a certain minhag or, or mitzvah in the, and to do it in a different fashion. But if it's just to add something that was not previously recited, Rav Moshe feels that that's not called changing the minhag amaka. He says, He says, He says, The Gemara says, If you don't have the heskim of the Rav, then you can't change anything, even if the majority want it. The Gamsarach Shia has come as Rav HaKahal. And you also need the majority of the kahal to say, we, yeah, we're, we're happy with this. Because even if the rub wants to change, but the majority of the kahal does not want to change, that also will not fly. You need two criteria in order to add something to the davening that wasn't previously said. And that is the majority of the kahal says, yeah, that's a good idea. And the rub says, yeah, it's a good idea. Right? But if you have one and not the other, then you can't change. Velochein, yeah. velochein. <laughs> and therefore, if, it's a, if there's a desire among the, in the Kehila to start saying the David Mizmar, even though it was never said before, he says, or there's a desire among the Kehila to start inserting Shir Hamalos during the Aserasi Mechuva between Yishtabach and Borchu which, let's say, the minute of the shul is not to say it, and now you go, want to come along and you want to institute it. He says, He says, there are very valid halachic arguments to be made why you should not say Ledovid Mizmor, and why you should not say Shira Malos Mi Mamakim during Aser Simei Tshuva after Yishtabach. I acknowledge that. They might constitute a hefsek. Nevertheless, Mikol Mokom Mikivin Shahiyazeh below Maaseh you cannot say that the minog of the shul was, we don't say this. In other words, you can say that the minog of the shul is to do something, but you can't say that the minog of the shul is not to do something. You can't say that they're, they're dafka makpid not to. That's Rav Moshe's argument. That's his, that's his svara. And therefore, and therefore, it's okay if the majority of the kahal and the rub want to change it and wants to institute David Mizmor or Shira Malos, then you can. And also, well, I don't remember, did we say halal the night, uh, first two nights of Pesach? Yeah. In the shul? So let's say the, the, the minute of the shul was not to say halal, and now a group of people say, look, we want to say halal in the shul. Right? So he says, Lo shaykh lomar shahay etzla minak shalom lomar. Ela shalom haya minak lomar lomar. He says, it's not that they dafka had a minak not to say it, but they didn't have a minak to say it. There's a difference between having a minak not to do something versus not having a minak to do something. You see the difference between the two? So therefore he says, Lachain bim rotz and rovak kali chom lahanik vadafka veskim arabkid leel. Therefore, if you have the majority of the Kahal wants to say Halel uh, after uh, the night of the uh, Pesach, or Mimamakim, or whatever it is, and the Rav is Maskim, then you can do it. But if you have something 
that actually contradicts a prior minute of the shul. Kimo Bamir's Hoshanos, like the recital of Hoshanos. And now people are annoyed because they got to take out their lulav and put it back and then take it out again. So they want to switch it to saying it after Halel. And like he brings from the Bach that there's a good argument to say that that's what the mission is advocating. Therefore, Therefore, Rav Moshe says you're not allowed to change. Not allowed to change. Ramosha adds another interesting form. He says the Torah only brings two minhagim. He brings the minhag to say it after Musaf, and he brings the minhag to say it after Kriyas the Torah. But uh, there's no other supporting minhag that the Torah, you know, supporting source in the Torah, in the, what he calls the Rishonim, to advocate for saying it after Halel. Of course, don't you think Ramosha was familiar? with the Maram Galanti? Of course he was. But he very carefully selected his words. He says, there's Ein lahem makor me rishonim. Even though that was the minog Yerushalayim. But it's not a makor in the rishonim. And therefore, you shouldn't, and therefore, Ein Rishayim listens, you don't have permission to change. Okay? So you have it. There you go. Um, does that mean uh, that I can tell you definitively that the Shul's minog will never change from uh, saying in the Hoshanas after Musaf, saying Hoshanas after Halal, I can't guarantee you, but certainly we've seen a very strong language from Rav Moshe who says you're not supposed to change. And so I, I don't see really, I, uh, I, uh, you know, it seems pretty clear from Rav Moshe. Now, does that mean that Rav Moshe is the final word on the issue? Again, I'm, I'm just, I'm telling you that it would be very difficult, in my opinion, to be ever, ever to be able to change a well-established minhag of the shul. I will tell you this, when I was, as I was the founding rabbi of another shul in Los Angeles, so the first year, our shul was comprised of a whole bunch of people, some were Nusach Ashkenaz, some were Nusach Sfard, so that we had said, we decided it, because there, even though there were a lot of people who wanted to do dealer's choice, that is what they call it, they figured, say, you know what, let's just do, let's, whoever, whoever gets up for the Amad, if it's a Nusach Ashkenaz, we'll do a Nusach Ashkenaz. So I said, come on, Rabbi, I said, you can't do that. The shul has to have a Nusach. So we settled on Nusach Ashkenaz, because it's my Nusach. But after a year of a lot of grumbling and complaining, we decided to put Hoshanas after Halel, instead of doing Hoshanas after Musaf, because even though uh, Nusach Ashkenaz predominantly does Hoshanas after Halal, but after doing the research and looking at the Maram Galanti and looking at the Rabbi Yaakov Etlinger and seeing that there truly is strong basis to do it after Halal, I felt that because in order to avoid the, the grumbling in the Kahal, and we're still in the incipient stages of the formation of the Minhagan of the Shul, so we pushed it, we moved the uh, Hoshanas to after Halal. But in a Kehillah where the Minog has been for the past 30 years to do Hoshanas after Musaf, I think it's a much the more difficult thing. And uh, what's that? <laughs> That's the Minog of every Shul. <laughs> no matter what we do, they'll be good. Then if we push it to Halal, the, the women are going to say, How, what happened? I come to Shul every year looking forward to Hoshanas. Yeah. It turns out what Ramosh is saying is, if you started to say something, you can't not say it. In other words, you're saying that... Correct. Correct. If the, was to, add, if the minute was to proactively do something, you don't have a right to take it out. But if there was never a minute to say something, that's different from a minute to not say something. Yeah. But don't those people who don't want it to change say, we had a minute not to say it? Isn't that their argument? <laughs> that is an argument. And Moshe's response to this is not a valid argument. Someone came over to me because I instituted the practice, because the Shulchan Aruch writes that uh, right before you do Chavita Sa'arava, right before you beat the Arava, you're supposed to do Na'anuim, you're, you're supposed to shake it in all six directions. Before Sharama, no one argues with the Ramah, right? So someone says, that's not our minute. I said, what are you talking about? It's not your minute. You have this written in the Shul's Gabai list that we have a minute Davka not to do the Na'anuim like the Ramah says. It's ridiculous. There's a big difference between not having a minute to do something because, by, believe me, by the time we're at that point in davening, everyone's ready to go home and no one's thinking about what we're doing, what we're not doing. <laughs> so I said, so that's why Shulchan Aruch says you got to do it. You got to do the non-nuim. So do the non-nuim. 
Don't tell me this not, we, our minute is not to do that. That's no such thing. That's, you see that very clearly from, from remotion. There's no such thing as a minute not to do something. There's maybe not a minute to do something, but it's, that's very different from a minute not to do something. Okay? Good. 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 Good.